I grew up in the Gaza Strip, and like many of you, I took water for granted. Until one day I turned on the tab, and there was no water for us to drink. Shortly after that, the first Palestinian uprising, known as the Intifada, erupted. It was a turning point in my life, because it got me so interested in water issues, and it fueled my passion about finding solutions to the global water crisis. It also got me to think, what would happen if we don't have enough clean water for everyone to drink? You wouldn't drink this cup of water if I told you that there is a 90% chance that it is unfit for human consumption, would you? Of course not. But what if, what if I told you that's all you had? What would you do? That's the exact ethical and humanitarian dilemma facing my family and more than one million other human beings in the Gaza Strip tonight, teetering on the edge of one of the biggest humanitarian disasters on the planet. According to the World Health Organization, 90% of the water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption. Access to adequate water in terms of quantity and quality is severely restricted. The Jordan River is drained and polluted, and because of that, the Dead Sea water level is dropping one meter each year. That's about three feet each and every year, causing these massive sinkholes that you can see on the screen. It is estimated that within the, the next three decades, the Dead Sea will actually live up to its own name and completely vanish. Nothing is done to save it. Now, this region is not an anomaly in that sense. There are many regions around the globe facing similar water issues, like here in the U.S., as you can see on this map. This problem is so pervasive that one out of seven people in the world today does not have access to clean drinking water. And it's getting even worse. It's estimated that half of the world's population could actually face water scarcity by the year 2030. So the Middle East is just the canary in the coal mine. If they run out of water to sustain their population growth and food production, then we are next. This is the Colorado River and Lake Powell. And its drought sounds all too familiar. Ask farmers in California and people whose life depended on what once used to be the Colorado River Delta. You can see the bathtub brings on the walls indicating past water levels as they slowly receded. Today we are being challenged on a whole new biblical scale, and it's a stark reminder of what's at stake for all of us, our survival. Let's talk about how we ended up in this situation and the implication of not having enough clean water for everyone to drink, which to some apparently means water wars. To that end, the former UN Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, once said, fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and even wars in the future. Also, Mr. Ismail Sirajuddin, the former Vice President of the World Bank, said, the wars of the 21st century will be fought over water. Nothing epitomizes this view more than the term rivals. It actually comes from the Latin word rivalis, which means one who uses a stream or a river in common with another. This water wars view is very pervasive and widespread, and it focuses on the demise of humanity as a result of water shortage and potentially water wars. And what this narrative is pretty much saying is that water was the source of conflicts in the past and will continue to be the source of conflicts and even outright wars in the future. And that the Middle East? The Middle East will be the first stage on which these wars will play out. And while interesting and pervasive, this water war narrative is non-factual, scientifically inaccurate, and it fails to offer real solutions or future direction beyond inciting fear. What if I told you that there is another option? that these assured wars never need to take place, and that there is a way out, not only for the Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, but also 
for the many people living around the globe and other regions facing similar water shortage issues, like here in Colorado, California, and elsewhere. We looked at many conflicts in the past, as well as negotiated settlements, and we found no evidence whatsoever to substantiate this water war argument. On the contrary, we discovered that when water was involved as part of the dispute, people tended to cooperate, not altercate. And the closest we ever came to a water war is this. It doesn't look so bad, does it? Actually, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> There are many examples from all over the world, Pakistan and India, Lesotho and South Africa, where these countries entered into negotiations over water while they were in an officially declared state of war. However, as they set out to resolve their dispute over water, they found themselves resolving a lot more than just water. Water gave them the courage and the strength to look and see eye to eye and negotiate and resolve other high politics issues, seemingly insurmountable. Water also allowed them to consider other important dimensions linked to water, such as land, sovereignty, food security, and even energy. And that's because you can actually trade water for other things, like food production or energy production. And that's what we call virtual water. But then how do you explain this? This is what over 20 years of negotiations did. Wars and destruction. This is Gaza City. After three brutal wars in only six years. And it's yet another stark reminder of what happens when we choose to ignore one of the most basic human rights, water. And it's easy for people to confuse this with water wars. It would be shocking if they don't. But here's the reality. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict is widely known as the mother of all conflicts for a reason. And that's because all previous attempts to resolve it have miserably failed or exacerbated the situation on the ground. You may ask, how could peace negotiations for over 20 years lead to more wars? Well, are you ready for this? We found out that water was actually left out of these negotiations altogether. Water was one of three issues that were not addressed, talked about, or resolved. Water, Jerusalem, and the right of return for the Palestinian refugees are the three issues that were deferred to the final rounds of negotiations, which never happened. So they overlooked water. They overlooked the right to life and the catalyst for peace, and this is the result. Wars, destruction, and regional instability. We also found out that, like my, many other disputes, water was not the source of their conflict, but rather an obstacle to peace. And that was the bad news. And by the same token, the good news is that if we remove this obstacle, then we are one step closer to achieving peace. This is a remarkable seed of hope and a stentorian call for peace. What we need to do is to use water as a catalyst for peace by allocating it equitably among all parties. And then and only then will we be able to build a solid foundation for a just, lasting, and robust peace. If you can negotiate over water, the sustainer of life, you can negotiate over anything. Because what you're saying is that you value life, all lives, not just yours, but your rivals as well. And when you offer someone water, you offer them life. You offer them the ultimate olive branch. Obviously not the questionable cup of water that I offered you at the beginning of this talk. For me, water is the ultimate peacemaker because it catalyzes peace, not war. And if we truly understand what this really means and take action in our own lives, and take ownership of this incredible movement that focuses on conserving resources, not squandering them, sharing them, not dividing them, building bridges, not walls, and creating allies, not enemies, we will be able to change not only the world in which we live, in which we will pass on 
to our future generations, but also the lenses through which we see this world and perceive it, either a place to fight or a place to live in peace. Let's fight for peace, not water, and use water to resolve our fight, because after all, water is used to extinguish fires, not ignite them. Thank you very much.